so happy that it's not raining. Yeah. That's a big one for oh, me. Yeah. Um, obviously, we wanted to have this panel in place because we are on Veterans Day time. So the first half of the film, quite obviously, was focused on military service and also on the actions of Latinos, primarily those of Mexican ancestry as well as Puerto Rican, uh, in military service. I'm sure that we could have found other groups in the United States uh, that also served, whether from the Dominican Republic, of Cuban ancestry, and others. But those were the two primary groups in terms of numbers that were the main focus, particularly around the World War II. Although they didn't mention Korea, Korea also would have been a part of that, particularly for the Puerto Ricans in service. Um, so first of all, thank you all for agreeing to come here on the panel. and. I had a, a question I guess I wanted to start out with, which is just generally, what do you wish Americans in general understood about Latinos in military service? If you could tell anyone anything that was most important to you about what you wish they knew, how would you address that? And it doesn't really matter who goes first, feel free to jump in, otherwise I will call names. <laughs> I feel, uh, we're uh, just as equal as anybody else. We uh, come into the service uh, because we wanted to, most of us, at least during World War II, because we got a little letter from Franklin D. Roosevelt that invited us into the service, and it really helped many of us. We uh, really attempt to do our best from the Latin or Mexican Americans or Puerto Ricans, especially Puerto Ricans, really try hard, and they even try harder to advance. That's why we do have many decorated, especially during my period of time in the infantry, uh, decorated uh, when the word comes up, cowardness or human, and I do not, in 21 years, recall running into any Latin American that was a cow, uh, per se. So I feel we're equal. And by golly, I'll fight for it. Well, and I, I have to say, Franklin Delano Roosevelt certainly owed quite a debt to the Latino community for <coughs> that service in World War II. When we think about the numbers uh, of Latinos who served, estimates in World War II are in the hundreds of thousands. And so that's something that we need to think about in consideration of while today, Latino population is estimated at about 13% of the United States. That was not the percentage back then in World War II. So when you think of hundreds of thousands of folks who were drafted and or volunteered, that was a significant percentage of that population of that time in comparison to other groups. So that's something that we need to remember. But equality was a factor that we all need to really consider, especially with what we saw in the video and from what we have here firsthand. Yeah, yeah I want to add that to, to the best of my knowledge, the majority of the Mexican American, and that's primarily what there were where I come from, Gallup, New Mexico was approximately three quarters of Mexican American heritage. And of all, except for maybe a handful, all of us were in the service. We may have been drafted, and many of us didn't come back. Battle of the Bow, I mean, the, the Patan March, yeah. you may have heard of that. The 200th field artillery came from there. Latin Americans are as good old Mexican Americans. We were three quarters of that unit, New Mexico, and five came back to Gallup uh, from that Batan March. Those so are disturbing figures. So one thing to think about with that area of the country, I think we have to remember, because we're in the southeast here, and I think for a lot of people in the CSRA or in the southeast, somehow we don't always recognize the numbers, the participation, all of that of the Latinos, particularly in military service. But if we were out in the Southwest, that would be a very different story altogether. 
So if we actually look at the evidence from World War II in particular, you'll see all sorts of calls to action of veterans, whether it's from Taft, Texas, all the way over to Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, they'll be all in Spanish because there were that many people in those local towns who were Spanish speakers primarily or secondarily who would have served in those wars. And so we have plenty of evidence to show that it's really community-wide participation, the men who served overseas, but also the women who were serving at home. So let me get a couple of other voices in here. If we could add, I'll pick on Margie. <laughs> We could have anything that we wanted to say about your service that you would want people to know from a Latina perspective. What would you add to the conversation? Well, listening to my father uh, talk about when he was in the service in the mid to late 60s and he was in Vietnam, the way he was treated um, as a Puerto Rican compared to when I came in, I mean, completely see a complete difference. And now, if, if being in the military, no matter what branch, you know, we'll pick on each other, but, you know, this is sort of microcosm that's, you know, it's formed within there, and you have your brothers and sisters there, so it kind of goes, not all the times, but, you know, it kind of goes beyond that, you know, first glance of your skin color or gender or whatever, you know, can you get the job done, you know, are you a good soldier, and then, you know, you're kind of a big family at that point, at least for me anyway. Okay, with that perspective, which is really helpful to think about the difference between Vietnam War era and then today's <coughs> military service, I do want to say that the United States military actually integrated long before civil rights actions integrated schools and integrated bus stations and public spaces. The U.S. military was already working on that in World War II to desegregate the armed forces, but still, things took quite a long time in order to have the era that we have today where we have such diversity in the armed forces that nowadays, even though the military does still have what they consider like cultural competency and diversity training and things like that, in a lot of ways it's not quite as needed, thankfully, as it certainly would have been in the World War II, Korea, or Vietnam era. All right, other voices. What would you add to the conversation about what you wish people knew about your military service or Latinos in military service or the conversation in, in general from the film? Mine's, after seeing this film, I know they, those Latinos that they have paved, paved the way in the inclusion because I never felt segregated in the military. I always felt inclusive in their whatever mission I was um, sent to or um, the interaction in the barracks or in missions, it was all inclusive. I felt part of the unit, and I think once you're part of the military, all barriers break down. Like she was saying, you, you're that, you have that military bond, that you know? You have that brothers in arms, sisters in arms mentality. And yeah, we do, you know, make fun of each other at some <laughs> point, but we do have that bond. And I felt from basic training, through my schooling, my languages, um, I, it was an awesome experience for me. <clears throat> But seeing what the pioneers of of the Latinos had to go through, I, I did not know about this, and that's I'm, I'm grateful for that. And sir, what would you add to the conversation? <clears throat> I came to the United States to go to school. Half of the family had moved in to California, the other half to Florida. So I said, I'm gonna go to school in California. I was 20 years old when I landed in Miami, but I didn't like it. And I went by bus to Los Angeles. That was the first time I saw the whites only, black restaurant, black. And I had to fight for that because I had a friend, who, my friend from Miami all the way to, to Los Angeles, who was uh, Puerto Rican. I think he was mixed half. American have white, and they told him, you go in the back of the bus. And I said, he's not going in there. We're not going there. We're going to stay here. And that was my first encounter, about three weeks in country. What year might that have been? 58. 58. Okay. And uh, 
they left us alone. They said, okay. And, uh, but every time we have to uh, stop, you know, four days to, to get to Los Angeles, we had that problem. Mm -hmm. But eventually I got to uh, LA, and it was nice because it's just like being in Mexico. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I could speak my language. I uh, read my books. And I said, I'm going to go to school. They gave me a test to go to school, and they said, you have an eighth grade education, according to us, in English. And uh, I had finished high school in Honduras. So I said, OK, what do I do? <coughs> do I learn English more? And uh, I did. That's all I did. I worked um, part time. And uh, in 62, no, in 50. Yes, yeah, 62, I got the letter from the Selective Service System. I was a legal resident, so I had the same rights as a citizen. Everything, just like a citizen. And they said, if you're going into the Army, report to the uh, station. So like in the movie there, Garcia, I was afraid that I, they were going to send me to infantry. I didn't want to go to infantry. I want to do what I was studying for. I want to be in law enforcement. So they told me, if you go out the draft stage, you go for two years. If you forget that, and you go for three, you pay military police school at Fort Gordon, Georgia. I didn't know where Georgia was, Fort Gordon. And uh, I said, I'll take an extra year, and uh, I'll go to MP school. So that's what it was. After basic training in Fort Ord, which was nice, uh, mostly half what uh, Mexicans and the other half from all over the United States. And I didn't have any problems. I learned everything. I have some problems with new things, technical things. But eventually I graduated, came to Fort Ord to MP school, graduated from there. I went to Fort Hood, Texas, at the MP. While in Texas, my unit, which was a combat military police battalion, was sent to Oxford, Mississippi. James okay. Meredith. Entering Ole Miss. Entering Ole Miss. OK, this is a historic desegregation event where angry white mobs in Oxford, Mississippi, were preventing the entrance, including the governor of that state, from letting that first black student enter into and we have gentlemen like this who are there to protect. Yeah, brand new MP Jesus. with a big M1 rifle and bayonet, bigger than I. And uh, like in the movie, he said, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, this guy wants to go to school. They won't let him go to school. I don't know what's wrong. And we were living in tents at the airport. The citizens, citizens of uh, Oxford didn't like the military because what we were doing. We were helping James Meredith to stay there. And they had riots, and we had riot control and everything. I got hurt. I was sent to um, Memphis Naval Hospital. And uh, after that, I was made back to Fort Hood again, and that was it. Then I was lucky enough to they send me to France. I also speak French. And I was lucky because I went to school for all. And, uh, I went to spring school also in France. It's been the most beautiful three years I had in my career in France. Awesome. Doing empty work, but there was no problem. GIs were good. <laughs> there was no dope, no nothing. None of, that, none of the Vietnam stuff. No, oh, <laughs> I'm coming to that. <laughs> well, uh, after France, I went to Panama. That when the problem started. Uh -oh. Panama, because of the language, put me to work with the Panamanian police. <clears throat> and there we have problems because besides all the armed forces of the United States, the armed forces from other countries go through, especially Navy. And you, that was the problem. Downtown Panama on weekends, boy, I'm telling you. So I was lucky to leave Panama alive. <laughs> and, uh, Good thing that I left the MPs there and went to, I was accepted into the CID, American Army Criminal Investigation Command. 
as an investigator. I started my apprenticeship there and came to Fort Gordon again to be a lead school on ship to Vietnam. Brand new again, brand new criminal investigator in Vietnam. People, including my mother, said, why do they need criminal investigators in the army? And I, when I explained to her why, she was pretty, she didn't, she didn't believe it, you know, what was going on in the army, especially Vietnam, and the way it was run, that was the problem, you know. Generals, I learned this from this book. Generals, history is being nice to generals in World War II. And uh, after that, they weren't. The reason was that in World War II generals, the, the, the top brass will take care of those generals and commanders who weren't any good. They relieved them like that. And only the good ones survive. And you have people like Eisenhower, Python, Bradley, good people. And uh, that's why they said they lost some battle, won the war. But after that came the problem. Korea. Korea, they tried to say, okay, you don't have to fire too many generals, but they're not good. Keep them. It became politics, involved, everything that was going on. I was still too young. I didn't go to Korea, Korea. But in Vietnam, after Korea, in Vietnam, and in Vietnam, I was 30 years old. I was a sergeant when I went there, criminal investigator. And uh, it was the same problem as in Korea. Commanders were not good. What's more important? She didn't care about anything. And I know later on, I, I, I was in one of his, um, he, he was going to travel someplace and I went to protective services. <coughs> and he didn't like it. He said, I don't want you guys here. You, you're not good. Don't follow me. And he disappeared and got lost and everything. And we forced a plane. But uh, in 1970, had a problem. I showed it to him in the book. There it is. One overdose death every day. Suicides. Fragging. The GIs throwing frag grenades to the commanders and to the sergeants. The only reason we survived in Vietnam was because of the non commissioned officers, the sergeants, and the junior officers. That's the only reason. That's what I asked God when I was there. I know you won't get me alive when I'm at this war, but get me out of Vietnam and it did. Because it was tough. And I didn't know. That part I didn't like. And I, I worked in civilian clothes, but I, I was in the combat zone. I did, never had a rifle, never had anything but my 38, my handcuffs, because we were arresting more GIs putting GIs in jail, and civilians uh, organized crime from everywhere. We have a Korean division there. They were involved in black market. They had a Filipinos. They were involved in black market. The only good ones were the Australians and New Zealanders. They're real good soldiers. Okay. You know, the others are good and tough soldiers. But when they're off, that's it. So I never had any problems. I went from... Uh, then I'm to Los Angeles, worked there, again because of the Spanish language. I worked, uh, what they put me to work? Narcotics. Because they knew I worked narcotics in Vietnam. I formed the first narcotics unit in Vietnam. So in Los Angeles I did it again. And after that, so I moved to Korea. And it was a good, a good, a good place, different people. And we have Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and everything. We always have problems. Uh, never had any problems. And I was always lucky to have my friends, Spanish-speaking people. I love it. Everywhere I went. And, and I also spent time in Germany, three years, and uh, in the States, uh, for Jackson, South Carolina. 
I was in Puerto Rico three years, retired there. I was in charge of the DID office. In Korea, I went the second time by myself, and I was in the DMC. There it was combat there. And again, I, uh, I got along with all the Spanish-speaking people, and the majority were Spanish. I don't know why. That year in the DMC, the majority were Spanish. So it was good for me. Yes, that Korea starts in 1950 and goes on for a couple of years, and there was significant Latino participation in the Korean War. And the remark about the generals and those in the higher up not being very good is really true, particularly for the Puerto Rican regiment. There was the 65th that got sent to Korea and were told essentially to defend uh, a hill against the Chinese that were coming in and it was an indefensible place. It was, there was no cover, there was no place to dig trenches, there was, and they were sent simply to be cannon fodder. And that was one of many stories about Latinos that participated in Korea. But Korea, while it had very strong U.S. participation from all ethnic groups, didn't have to deal with the drugs, and the criminal elements, and things that happened with the Vietnam War. So that adds a whole different perspective onto the, the issues that face I want to ask if anybody in the audience has questions for our panelists who might be brave. Dun, dun, dun. Anybody that would have a question for the panelists? Otherwise, I could talk This is a political question. Uh, ben Carson said that um, he, he didn't lie in his biography uh, for, for going to uh, West Point, uh, but... Uh, I think for somebody who actually served in the military, when you hear politicians lie, uh, being uh, servicemen, probably is the, the biggest slap in the face. You probably want to, sh to be uh, killed, uh, get a sh shot in Vietnam, but not coming here and hear uh, political uh, running for president and in line about uh, being in the service. Why all of a sudden everybody want to be in the service, but they don't want actually to serve? Uh, I don't know, it's kind of like ironical. And they supposed to be the commander in chief. Can I, I'm gonna explain this just in case our students aren't aware of this. Um, we have a, a person who is running for the Republican nomination for president, and this would be Ben Carson. And he came out saying that he had been offered a full scholarship to West Point. It turns out that there is no record that he even applied, let alone getting a scholarship, and all who actually do gain entry into West Point, it is tuition free. So there isn't an idea about a scholarship. So that's what we're, we're talking about here. Would anybody like to take the question? Well, it seems nowadays, especially with, you know, you have Facebook, the internet, so people are more, you know, informed as far as, you know, what's going on. And, you know, you just look at your stream on Facebook, anybody has Facebook, whatever, or whatever you look up, you know, the, you know, people supporting the vets today and everything like that. And, and you know, that bond that you have with your fellow, you know, vets or when you were still soldiers, you have that bond that you can't really describe it. And then to have somebody come along that hasn't been through what you've been through, whether you've been deployed or not, but, and then try to, it kind of steals something away from you. And that's how people feel. I mean, it is a slap in the face. And you have that now, I don't know if anybody's heard of, you know, the Stolen Valor. Stolen Valor, you love, yeah. Yeah. That if anybody poses um, as a person. Imitates yeah. a service member or. Uh, For any officer. reason, you know, can, you know. They could get legal. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. This, um, this, um, it's not only Ben Carson. Um, um, Hillary Clinton said that she was, she got fired at her book, and she's never got fired at. So it does infuriate um, veterans, either whatever party they are, that you would embellish either being being a casualty of war or embellishing your records, because for those that actually been there and they served, like man. We signed up, or in your yeah. case, you got forced to sign up. Yeah. Um, but people know there's a lot of honor in being a, a service member, and sometimes they want to, you know, get the little foothold in that so they either get the veteran vote or the sympathy. Um, and that's just my take on that. Okay. Gentlemen, would you add to that? 
I have a training of uh, protecting dignitaries. Many times I have to protect the president, a group, big group. Uh, we have the training of the Secret Service and the CID have their own training also. And uh, I used to talk to the president, you know, Ford, uh, Johnson, uh, other president, when I was in their group protecting them, and they used to talk like that. And some were real nice, others naive of what's going on, completely. And the others with them were even worse, you know, senators, congressmen, and all that, because they used to scare us with saying, when we did something wrong, oh, we're going to have a congressional investigation. Now we laugh at them. <laughs> They're going to investigate. They're the ones who need to be investigated, you know, because they don't like to do things, you know, like you do it because you believe it's your duty, it's an honor thing. You know. I see, the mind know the hard field. There are no words that can take the place of that. So whatever politicians say, that's all they like to say. Like he said, Hillary Clinton said, as soon as I landed in that thing, they received fire and I have to run. You know, that's the way they talk. They all talk like that. And I, I would also add, too, that um, as I recall, previous presidents also said about their military service, and there was question, I think it was George W. Bush had been questioned a number of times about whether he did or did not actually have military service. This is something that is kind of an, an issue that's long standing. And so maybe we could take it in the positive as they wish they had the honor, the valor, or you know, the, the camaraderie that they perhaps yeah. didn't have, instead of looking at the supreme dishonesty and saying I did something that I did not do. So we'll, we'll hope it's the, the former rather than perhaps the latter. Um, I saw another hand that was up. Yes. No, I don't think so. I think it was equal when, uh, like I said, for 20, I was in the Army 26 years. For 20 some, I wore civilian clothes. And when I went to Vietnam, I had to go in uniform. And uh, I landed, changed the civilian clothes, they don't work. When I came back a year later, 1970, 19, December 70, it, we landed in California and said, change in civilian clothes. Don't go to the airport in San Francisco because you know, get tied on, spit on, hit, they're going to talk to you bad, this and that. But that was to blacks, white, brown, they didn't care. It was a group, especially San Francisco. You know, where all the bad things was going on there. And, uh, and we did that. We had to come in civilian clothes. And nobody knew who we were. And uh, I felt bad. That was the only bad thing I felt my 26 years service in the Army. Why I had to hide, you know, and, and, and throw away my uniform and put in civilian clothes when I just came back from Vietnam. But that's the way it was. After a while, I forgot everything about it, and I was having fun in Los Angeles again, <laughs> working in civilian clothes. And uh, it's, a, it's a military state, you know. The Navy is big in California, Air Force and everything, more than Army. And uh, everybody loves you know, in, in When I was there in 1970, there were 3,000 AWOL deserters in Saigon area alone, and in Los Angeles there was 1,000. A lot of people living because of that. 
people didn't like it. And they said, I'd rather go a wall because the draft was big then. And the draft got good people into the service. Doctors and lawyers and policemen and some of the uh, some of the bad generals one time they told them in Vietnam, uh, why don't you use this uh, National Guard from uh, uh, Miami, they're all policemen, and you can form a military police faction to help the community, because that's how Vietnam was supposed to be fought. You know, it was an insurgency. It wasn't the army prepared for, they're going to be fighting the Russians with tanks and artillery and everything. And it happened to be with a guy in pajamas, you know, with a rifle in the woods. And they say, why don't you form a police with all these dead uh, Miami Dade guys? And they were all policemen. In Los Angeles also, the majority of the reserve people, National Guard, they were policemen, lawyers, engineers, they're good people. You know? But after that, they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to join the Other questions? I've never been in the military. Obviously, she has. And she she has actually taught me quite a bit since we've come together, but I'm sure she's probably got some interesting perspective. Uh, I've got a tough skin, so how would you respond? It was a little difficult. <coughs> I mean, I was... If I was a terrible teacher. Just no. like that. <laughs> <laughs> not true. Anyway, 19 going in, and uh, you're 19, you're going in something, and basically you get thrown into adulthood. And you know, by the time I was 22, 23, I had six, seven soldiers that I was responsible for who were my age when I came in. So you're like hit, you know, like thrown into the deep end until you swim, and you know, at this young age. And you do so many years, you know, I did, you know, 10, my husband did quite a few, 27 years. So you, you just live in this world, and then you come out, and you, it's like, you know, aliens. <laughs> if they come and talk to you, if you were to talk to an alien, it's like, you have nothing to bond with. You're coming from rule and order, and then <laughs> yeah, and then you see the the, the same, pro, um, you know, the the age of the students that you would go to class with, and you you try to get to know them and stuff because you know, you know, you're not in the military anymore. Okay, you know, pat on the back and everything, but you're not in anymore. You know, so you try, and there's it's just very difficult because you're dealing with, you know, a lack of maturity, say, or someone who. Um, doesn't understand or won't accept that you decided to go to, you know, the military and move up going to college or anything like that. So it's, you know, the... Carrie, you could tell the professors, Ignorance. don't put us in groups. Yeah. <laughs> don't put us. But I agree with her. Um, you don't begrudge the young students for, you know, uh, you go into the military young, you already live two, three lives, especially if you go on tour. And, you know, you already have handed responsibility as a sergeant or as a you know private coming up or officer that there's classes for that management um, risk assessment and then you're coming back to school and you know the students are wow you know my boyfriend broke with me it's the end of the world or my or this and that but you don't want to begrudge them but you're sitting there and you're like Believe me, life is not over, you know, don't. And the professor makes you sit in groups, go sit in groups and... Um, well, we're so yet professors, maybe a couple of years younger than you, in my case. And, you know, he talks Which is to not you. me. <laughs> he talks to you as if you were, a, you know, a freshman in college, 18, 19, whatever the age is. And you're like, you know, I understand where you're coming from, sir, but don't talk to me like that. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's an issue, but you know, it, it, on both sides, you kind of have to, because, you know, being out now, we have to kind of, you know, integrate with you know, civilians now, so, <laughs> you know, but, you know, we work at it. I mean, I don't really know if there's an actual thing that we can do. I mean, it's a generational thing, it's an experience thing, an age thing, too, so. If I do, you, do you feel that, that in some ways, uh, people that have been in the military, can be segregated from other students a little bit? Yeah, because, you know, if you find a fellow vet, you know, automatically you'll bond to them because you have similar experiences, even more so if you 
deployed or had a similar uh, job in the Army or, you know, served in similar locations, you know, go on and on and you bond with them quickly and then it's kind of like us against them, you know, and kind of <laughs> use them as, okay, everything's okay. And plus, well, nowadays, you know, with everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan, so they have their own personal issues. And it's just very hard to kind of have a civilian who's never been through that understand exactly what you're going through. So, you know, it kind of helps to have somebody that, you know, may not have gone through it with you, but understands where you're coming from. So, of course, you're going to bond to that. And if I could say from a professor's perspective, um, there's usually at least one student in every one of my classes every year that self-identifies as being military. And they will actually usually tell me where they've been deployed. And part of the problem is, again, a lot of it is non-traditional age. And so how to incorporate that into a classroom environment and also the experiences. Because a lot of the current students coming back from deployment often are suffering from PTSD and other problems. And so there's an added element there of need and, and help that can't always be addressed in a classroom environment. So that's something from a professor's point of view that I'm happy when students let me know, you know, what this background is. But if I don't know, I also can't help. So, you know, I'm glad that students actually will say something and that we try to, you know, figure out how to you know, best aid students in this environment. And a lot of those students have been, you know, Latino and Latina students as well. Other up there? I just had a Mr. Valenzuela, um, how did you end up in the military? You, you served in World War II. How did you end up? I think you told you told me, but you didn't tell everybody else. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, after being drafted, then the uh, Went to Mark's Field for five weeks of training, May 17th of 43, and then by August, with the aviation engineers, we were in Europe, August of 43. And then, uh, as uh, mentioned before, we built the airstrip, the airfields. And uh, either the ones that existed at the time in order to carry our big bombers, they had to be extended, new taxiways built. So in England, we worked 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. Once we got to Normandy, uh, then we never had any shifts we worked. But the primary goal of uh, the initial part of my service was being a truck driver with an engineer. And t I'll tell you, an engineer stays pretty busy hauling gravel, cement, and whatever to build these airfields. And then after World War II, uh, went to Korea at 47, 48. Came back from Korea, went to Germany, 48, 51. And then 51, here stateside, went to OCS, Officer Candidate School. Then 51, 52 stateside went to Korea with 1st Cav Division, 8th Cav. Then come back to Korea a year or so later. And to, in all, I spent 21 years in the service. Six, seven years were enlisted, and there were 14 years were officer, of which. Uh, I always said that was the smartest move I ever made when I went to officer candidate school. Uh, but most of the to my tour was with the infantry. And we didn't have all this uh, in reference to politics and uh, the way it is. People are so much better informed today than in my day. The people were behind the serviceman during World War II. There was no questions about it. That's why we got Rosie the Riveter. That's why, because they were behind it. That's why this country, as far as I'm concerned, from what I understand, did not have a military force to speak of before Japan hit 
Pearl Harbor, but the people came together, and I don't give a hoot who they were. They came together, and that's the reason why equipment out our ears, manpower sufficient, and it was enough that the whole country, per se, you always got that radical, <laughs> but the whole country was behind it. Now, when it comes to poor Vietnam, I can recall it. it the country made a complete turnaround phase. It turned all the way around. I don't understand it. And now then, I do understand the part that why in the world are we always in war? We're in it now, over in the Far East. We are in it because we are a power. That's the reason I think we are the strongest nation in the world. And if any, no one believes it, let them try taking us on. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer in it. And like I mentioned, it takes all of us. We're all good Americans. We harass each other. We razz each other. But when the chips are down, we come together. Believe me. If they were to drop a bomb, Richmond, the whole country would probably come into it. That's the way I feel. And I'm sorry, I avoided your question. I, I lost total <laughs> sight of the question. Yeah, so I go ramping off on all of But that's my prerogative because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> we are soldiers. And I don't care whether it's a Marine, Air Force, or anybody, we are soldiers. And whether it was World War II, Vietnam, or whatever, it still takes those people behind the line. As they said, it takes seven people behind to support that one guy online. If you, online means the line of infantry. And we have the combat forces, and we have our support forces. And any and everything supports the infantry, armor, everything does. And I'm ramping and raving on, but the, 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 uh, doesn't make more soldiers. And it doesn't make any difference where it is. These young fellows coming back from Afghanistan, they're still soldiers. And we went through the same. Vietnam was a terrorist, I think, personally. I don't, you don't know, you didn't know. We knew where the enemy was at, per se. No, they, they knew didn't. where we were. We didn't. You didn't know where they were. They were in the woods, and they didn't have a uniform. So that's the difference. You know? and we had lines. That's why Patton could move his line. Because yeah. he knew how to encourage his head. Like they said, our blood and his guts. But we moved. When he spoke, and we all admired him, even though we cursed him on the other side. Okay. So, I don't know, I evaded your question. No. <laughs> we all have a rep, but that's my prerogative. I think I'm you did quite well, and I'm, I'm pleased with that. I want to actually ask all of you kind of an open-ended question. Is there anything in the film that you totally agree with and or totally disagree with? How do you feel about the film's representation of Latinos? I, I thought people were really proud because I could see that at least somebody was acknowledging yes. mm -hmm. that there was this I love that photograph Latino of American smiling and putting that medal of, of honor. I mean, that was just uh, you know one of the best moments I think of the film is to see the president himself so engaged and so pleased to be able to do something like that. What about the, the rest of you? What do you think? Agree it was an eye opener. Uh, I, I do agree. It was definitely an eye opener, and um, the soldiers that we have coming back from war right now, which I think is a double whammy for the vet, the, the Vietnam vets, and prior to that, um, we have something that they diagnose called PTSD. There's resources to do so. Vietnam War, or before then, it was called shell shock, and yes, there was a lot of soldiers back then in the Vietnam War, and I think we asked that question back there, that they were AWOL, 
or they will leave, but they will leave for a reason. They didn't have a treatment to come back. And um, right now, that classification is PTSD, you're being treated. They didn't have that in the Vietnam era awards prior to that. And, and I think um, that's been a generation that this country that still owes and knows a lot goes to that era. They've done a lot and they've dealt with a lot of BS. What about our Vietnam veteran? How did you feel about the film's presentation of Latinos in war? In a couple of occasions, I almost cry again. <laughs> cry and burst. And uh, it, it was really good. I like it because uh, I have read some of that stuff there. So it's not someone's invention that you find sometimes you, know, you have so many GIs with so many ribbons and they're not there to read it yeah. or uh, things like that. So I was in Los Angeles before I came into service and after Vietnam I went to Los Angeles and I know how the uh, Mexican Americans feel about it. And, uh, I used to go to East L.A. a lot because of the language, like I said. At times, I felt the Army was used to me because of the language. They didn't care if I spoke English or not. They, they were glad I spoke Spanish, I spoke French, and I could handle myself. And uh, I'm just saying that. Uh, the uh, film, uh, it, it, it was like that. It was really like that. Uh, when I went to Los Angeles, they still had some artillery uh, pieces in three of the big mountains around Los Angeles. And uh, we have artillery people, of course, there. And one of my jobs was to keep it clean, to keep the GIs there clean from dope, because we still have a lot of problems. And the dope was coming out from Vietnam. GIs were sending a lot of heroin uh, and all that drugs to the United States. So it was a never ending. Until I left the service, it never, you know. And uh, here in, the, in Augusta, uh, after working so much against the people who use this, who produce this, who manufacture, who sell it, who transported. Uh, now I help an organization here in Augusta that helps the loved ones of those drug addicts. And uh, he loves to have me there because I always give my point of view for the law enforcement. Instead of being kind to people, I say, no. Nah. Something tells me this, this panel has very strong points of view, and I, I have a feeling that all of you are very good at presenting those, which is we all need to hear these viewpoints uh, from all of your experiences. Um, whatever the war, whatever the, the background, all of you have obviously things that are very important for the general public to hear. How much more? Has a real nice knack of being able to express himself in regards to war stories. Have you ever noticed that? If you get around I don't care what war is in, but we have a knack for spreading the war stories, whether they're ours or one of our buddies. We still have the knack for spreading it. That is wonderful, isn't it? I mean, to have our soldiers do that. And all those stories need to be captured. So whether you do it orally, whether you write it down, whether you share Even it with somebody else. Even if they're false. They can add color to the conversation. Other last thoughts? Well, thank you so, so much for being a part of it.